Okay, so what we talked about it last time, um, and we will continue from where we left off last time. We are, we are looking at uh, um, setting up for the simplex method, the solution procedure that we want to uh, perform the, on general problems of any size. What we talked about it and what I put in that uh, little handout that, uh, I, that you could bring with yourself was uh, what is the most uh, reminding you of some of the things that we talked about it. One was what, what is the most promising variable. When, when we talked about that, uh, we discussed the, uh, where am I? Okay. Uh, we discussed the case that we have an objective function with 5x plus 3, 1, 5x1 one plus 3x2, and we said, which one, which one looks more promising? 5x1 plus 3x2, something like that. And I said, which one looks more promising? And we said, the one that has the higher coefficient looks more promising. And then we said, why? Of course because it has the higher reward. Uh, increasing one unit on x1 will give us $5, for example, reward, as opposed to x2, that increasing one unit of x2 will give us only $3 reward on, um, on the, the z function. And then when we, some of the things that we have been talking about is about that, what is the feasible solution to the problem. Some of the things that I put in here for you as a reminder, what is the feasible solution uh, to the problem, of course, is a solution that when you plug in all constraints, all constraints, they, they all, the, the two sides of the um, inequality matches, so the left side is supposed to be less than the right side, it would end up to be uh, such. And all the variables would match the special uh, constraints that you have if they are all greater than or equal to zero. We need them to make sure that they are greater than or equal to zero. Uh, how many basic and non-basic variables? It is important, it's very, very important that we know about those, and that is uh, we have as many basic variables as we have Equation. equations or the constraints. Okay, and we are talking about the main constraint. We are not talking about the special constraint. So that is one of the, the, the things, and that's as many as uh, that. The rest of them are going to be non-basic uh, variables. And um, some of the other things that uh, uh, are put in here, so I should like, for example, um, how to relate the slack variable values to extreme points. We said when you are on the line, as we were talking about uh, the two-dimensional, when you are on the line, the slack variables of those lines are zero. So at any point, if you are in a four, five, six, seven dimension, um, the one that the point is created by uh, intersection of four, five, six, whatever hyperplanes, and the select variables on all those hyperplanes is zero when, when you are talking about that. What would stop you from increasing variables to infinity? Uh, we talked about that when we said that, uh, like for example, 5x1 plus 3x2, what would it stop you from uh, increasing x1 to infinity are the set of constraints. The constraints will stop you. Otherwise, the, your solution will be unbounded. But the constraints will stop you and say, stop, can't go any further. And the way that they stop you is that uh, if you go any further to adjust you going up, I have to make one of the other variables negative. And the moment that I do that, I violate the feasibility conditions. So that's one of the, th the other things um, that we talked about it. And uh, we said, what's the role of the critical constraint? We said, among the constraints, as you're increasing one value, one of them is going to be the one that 
reaches its limit. And the moment that you pass that limit, it will make one of your variables negative. So that, is, that becomes the critical constraints. And uh, what is the critical ratio is, it will give you an idea of how much you can increase that x value that you are working with. What is the relationship to the adjacent extreme points? We talked about that. I said the extreme points, two adjacent extreme points are basically the same set of basic and non-basic variable, except one of them has interchanged. So we stopped at that, and these are the basic knowledge that we are bringing to this session of, the, uh, of our class. Uh, we are going to do an example, and we are going to talk about it a little bit more. The problem that uh, I have selected to work with is given in this handout, and I'm just going to write that problem, which is in the form of 2x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus 2x4 plus 2x4 uh, less than or equal 20. Uh, the next one is x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3 plus 3x4 less than or equal 15. And the last one is minus x1 plus x2. And there is no x3 and plus 2x4 less than or equal 10. x1, x2, and x3 are given to be greater than or equal 0. We know that. And the uh, maximization function, and the maximization function is given as maximize 5x1. Um, actually, let me write that in a different color. <coughs> maximize 5x1 plus 4x2 plus 3x3 minus x4. And that is our z function. OK, uh, the first step that we talked about it was we have to convert this into a standard form. And to convert the standard form, we're just going to be adding slacks, changing the signs into equation. S2, changing the signs into equation, and S3. Notice one of the things that I always do, and it's a very good practice to do, is to write them underneath each other. I wrote my x's, x1's underneath each other, my x2 underneath each other, my x3 underneath, x4, and s1, and s2, and s3. I wrote them uh, in different places such that they are clearly shown to be um, on a specific color. Now, I have done that. The moment that I add slack variables, I will be adding slack variables to my special constraints. Non-negativity constraints are added to the, uh, to the case. And so you, I would have this problem. Now, how would I solve this problem? The, this, is, this is what we are going to be uh, talking about. It. So I'm going to do a setup such that as I go through the process, you will see uh, why it is just exactly the same thing. One of the easy way, first of all, is that I have to find a 
basic feasible solution. I will look in here and that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have now seven variables. I have seven variables and I have three constraints. So seven variables, three constraints. So I have three equations in here. Now, to solve this, I can only have three unknowns. Only three unknowns and three equations to solve it. So seven minus four is going to be three. And, or seven minus three is going to be four. I have to write it like that, okay? Seven minus three is going to be four, so I would have four non-basic variables and three basic variables. And again, the difference is non-basics, I will assign them the value of zero, and basic are the ones that I will find them by solving these system of uh, linear equations. Sorry, thank you. So, and then you say, well, let me see how I can do that. Um, is, if it is going to be by trial and error, it's going to take a long time for me to find it. One way that I can do it is to make sure that in each one of these equations, I have one variable that doesn't exist anywhere else. Three equation, one variable that doesn't exist anywhere else except in that equation with the coefficient of one. If that is the case, um, then I can approach it like that. And I'll look at X1, for example. X1 is another good candidate. X1 exists in every one of these equations and even on the objective function. X2 is not, X3 is not. Okay. X3 is better because it doesn't exist here, but it exists here, here, and there. As I look at this, I notice that S1 only appears on the first one, S2 only appears on the second one, S3 only appears on the third one. And they don't exist in the objective function. So what I do is that that's, that's the golden opportunity for me right now. I need three variables to make B to be basic and four variables to be non-basic. So I have my four variables. I will pick up X1, X2, X3, and X4 and make them non-basic, which would assign them the value of zero. Now what happens? I will have to plug those values back in here and find S1, S2, and S3. Now it becomes simply by saying S1 equal 20, S2 equal 15, and S3 equal 10. Because all of these are greater than or equal to zero, this is a feasible solution. Because I have set my arbitrary variables to zero, I have non-basic variables. And because I have calculated them based on these values, I have basic variables. Now you may say, well that was easy. Yes, of course that is easy. What if I for whatever reason, I decided to choose X1. I say, sure, you can choose X1 as one of your variables, okay? You can choose X1, but you have to make sure that X1 appears 
only in one of these equations. So I so said, well, let's pick up the first one. How can I make that 1x1? By multiplying this by 1 half. This is an equation. So I can multiply it by 1 half, both sides of the equation, and then x1 will become 1x1. 2x1 will become 1x1. I say, okay, I have 1x1 there. But I don't want any x1 here. So what do I do? I do the row operation, the same thing that we did with the trying to invert the matrix. What did we do? What you have to do is you have to, um, um, we multiply that row by a number and add it to this one such that this becomes 0x1. I have to get rid of that. I multiply that row by a number, add it to here, such that this goes away. Does this change the, uh, the form of this thing? Yes, it changes the form. Does it change the answer? No. You, it doesn't change the answer. But then, after you do that, it will make sure that you only have one x1. However, because x1 also appears there, I have to do something to get rid of that x1 also. And that's why when I use this format, I will make sure that that also is in the standard form. So I would say Z minus, 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 positive, and equal to zero. So the same thing that I did in here, I will do there. Now, let's look at the form of S1 in here. Let's look at the form of S1. How does this form look like to you? 1S1, 0S1, 0S1. Looks like a part of an identity matrix. And that's the main concept. So you can solve this by doing this. The problem with this, the problem with this is that there's no guarantee that after you do all those things, these values remain positive. So by just, just like that, trying to get a, a feasible solution, you may not be able to get a feasible solution. You would end up with a extreme point, with an extreme point, but that extreme point may not be feasible extreme point. Now, that idea is the basis for what we want to talk about. And it connects, and it connects the things that we have been doing so far. It is called the simplex method. The simplex method is a solution procedure for solving these problems. It's in a tabular format. So it's a table format. It's a table format. Now, table format looks like matrix format. So it, uh, these are just matrices sitting inside a table. And the way that you solve it is that you start with a table that represents one extreme point and then go to the next table which represents an adjacent extreme point. And then go to another table which represents an adjacent to that and so on. And you continue this until you reach the optimal solution. So let's, let's look at this and see how that process works. Just with the th same thing, with considering the same thing that I just talked about it. So I'm going to put this problem into a tabular format. And this is what I am going to be doing. I'm going to draw a line in here and I'm going to write 
all my variables. Remember that z is also a variable. I'm separating that because it's a, a special variable in there. And then I will write all my other variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, s1, s2, s3. And I will separate it from the right-hand side of this table, the right-hand side. And I have to identify that I use the terms RHS for right-hand side. Then I will copy these values into these table to make sure that that one is separated from the rest of them. I draw a line in here. I draw a line in here. Okay. I will put a Z in here. And then I would put all the coefficients that I have. There is a 1z, there is a negative 5 in here, there is a negative 4 in here, there is a negative 3 in here, there is a positive 1 in here, there is 0 in here, 0 in here, 0 in here, and 0 here. I would write my set of basic variables in here. What is the basic variable in here? S1. And there is no Z. There is 2. Coefficient of X1 is 2. Coefficient of X2 is 1. Coefficient of X3 is 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, and the right-hand side is 20. For the second one is S2. There's no Z. And it's 1, 2, 5, 3. 1, 2, 5, 3. Okay. And then you have 0 and 1s2 and 0s3 and 15. The third one is s3 and it has 0, negative 1, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, and 10. And that's the tableau that I have. I call this the basis. So basis is the set of basic variables. So now I have this. Before I go any further, let's look at some of these things. For example, I notice that I have, in the basis, I have one, two, three, four variables. So I have three equations in here and one equation up there. So somewhere in here, somewhere in here, the idea is that I will have an identity matrix of size four an identity matrix of size 4. 1, 0, 0, 0. That's always there. It's not going to change at all. OK? But in here, I have 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, which are the elements of the identity matrix. So now I, I say, OK, this is representing one extreme point. What is that extreme point it is representing? 
it is representing the solution of this is what? The solution in here is the solution of this is S1 equal 20. Remember? S1 equal 20. S2 equals 15. S3 equals 10. X1 equal 0, x2 equals 0, x3 equals 0, x4 equals 0. How do, I know, how do I know they are 0? They are non-basic, because these are the only basic ones. And z is 0. How do I read that when I have a table like that? For example, how do I read this line? This line is 1x1, while I'm repeating these things, you take a look at that second equation. 1x1, 2x2, 5x3, 3x4, no s1, 1s2, no s3 equals 15. OK? In this, in this identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, see where the 1's are and associate that 1 with what is written in here. That 1 with what is written in here. Underneath S2 and that. You should always remember this, that associated with these variables, there is an identity matrix inside this. There is an identity matrix inside that. And for example, on S1, the only thing that I need to do is move across here until I hit S1, and I said there is a 1 in here, and everything else on that column is 0. So this is, this is one basic feasible solution. Where is that basic feasible solution? It's the origin. It's the origin, you see? x1, 0, x2, 0, x3, 0, x4, 0. That's the origin of that system. <clears throat> so I have this. Now I want to go to an adjacent point. And what is the difference between adjacent point? One of the non-basic variables. Where are the non-basic variables in here? x1, x2, x3, x4. One of these non-basic variables will become basic, OK? Will become basic. And then you say, so what happens to these numbers? I say, you have to adjust them such that underneath that basic variable, you would have the element of identity matrix. If that, just for the sake of argument, just for the sake of discussion. Let's say that's going to be x4. If x4 replaced s1, then I would have 1 in here, 0 in here, 0 in here, and 0 there. Does it make sense? Make sense, Carl? If x4 replaced s1, if I have x4 in here, what should I have under x4? 1 across from x4 and 0 everywhere else. Just the same way that I have s1. s1, s1. There's a 1 here. Everything else is 0. If x4 replaced s2, 
Then in here underneath x4, here I would have a 1, everything else 0. So it depends on which one I am replacing. So there are two decisions to make. Which one of these non-basics to be made basic and which one of these are going to be replaced? These two decisions are the essence of simplex method. You pick one of the non-basics, you make it basic. Now let's go back to the original discussion that we had. What, and that was, that was this discussion. We had z equal 5x1 plus 3x2. And we were trying to maximize it. And we said, the better one for us is this because it has higher coefficient. But when you write this in standard form, how would it look? Now, did it make it any difference of which one is the better one? No, it's a still the same thing. I just wrote it in standard form. Uh, so, but in that, in that case, I said the one had, that has the most positive coefficient. Select that. In a standard form, how do I talk? The one that has the most negative the one. That has the most negative one. Okay? It's going to be the same thing. The one that has the most negative. So I will look in here and I say, which one of these things is going to give me the best results? I'm going to select. I'm going to select what I will call an entering variable because it is going to enter into the basis. Entering variable. What would that variable be? The one most negative, most negative entry in which row? That would be x1. Z row. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's something that makes sense. And what we do is just, we would put a sign here that this is going to be the entering variable. The other thing that we are going to be doing is we are going to draw a little boundary around it, oval, whatever it is, highlight it. We will call that the entering variable, the entering variable column. So I have identified x1, and I would say entering variable x1, and I would explain why. Most negative in 0. Now, remember about our discussion at the start of this session and the, in, the, in the class. If I keep increasing the value of x1, remember x1 is here right now, it's 0. x1 is 0. When it comes down here, when it becomes basic, it gets a value, OK? It increases from 0. From 0, it's keep, it keeps coming up. Why? It is because it is, improve, it is going to improve the z value. So you say, well, if I am going to increase that, why don't I just increase it to the infinity? We would say, you can't do that because there are some constraints that would stop you. 
And then you would say, how would I know? And that goes back to our discussion from last time. How would I know? I would identify the critical constraint. Okay, I would identify the critical constraint. The first constraint that is going to reach its limit, the first constraint that, I, that it would reach its limit. And how would I identify that? Remember that critical ratios that we took? We are going to be doing the same thing. So I'm going to increase x1, and on each one of these equations, and on each one of these equations, I'm going to increase x1. How far I can increase x1? Right now, s1 is what? 20. If I increase x1 to 5, let's say, to make it equal to 20, s1 has to go down. 5, 2 times 5 is 10. To make it equal 20, s1 has to reduce itself from 20 to 10. If I increase that to, let's say, 5, to, let's say, to 15, I would have 2 times 15, 30, equal 20. S1 has to become negative to adjust that equation, to keep the equation intact. 30 minus 10 equal 20. But that would violate this condition, that S1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. So how far can I increase x1 before s1 becomes problematic? 20 over 2 will give me 10. That's the critical ratio that we talked about it. So I can increase x1 up to 10 units. 2 times 10 is 20. It makes s1 0. S10 becomes non-basic. If I increase it a little bit above 10, a little bit above 10, S1 becomes negative. So the critical ratio for this is 20 over 2. What is for the second one? 15 over 1. What is for the third one? can't do it. There is none. Remember I told you if it is negative, there is no problem. You increase x1, right now s3 is what? 10. You increase x1, s3 increases. It doesn't decrease. So this is no problem for us. The way that we write them in this tableau is that we are saying that we are going to find the mean ratio. And mean ratio is only applied to these three equations, not at the top. That's why I write them like this, such that I don't get the urge to do that also. So I would do that. I will find 20 over 2, 15 over 1, and, and I put a dash in here. So I'm not going to do that. I will not do that. I will not write 15 over negative 1. I will say, this is no problem. These are problematic. These are critical. There's no cri crisis in here. These are critical. And then I will select the minimum of these two numbers. What is the minimum? That's 15. That's 10. OK? So. What is it associated to? That's one. That row. So I'm going to draw pretty much the same type of line around this, highlight that. And I would say this is the leaving variable. And in here, underneath this, I would say leaving variable is S1 
leaving variable is S1. And why I have to say why? Simple, I say mean ratio. The moment that I have done this, I have identified a row and a column. When they intersect these two, I will call that element the pivot. Everything Everything turns around this row and this column and that element. And now you say, well, you have identified this. So now I have an adjacent ex extreme point. An adjacent extreme point. What is that adjacent extreme point? We are going to write that adjacent extreme point in here. I'm going to erase this, but keep that in mind. I would do the same thing that I had in here. I would draw the same type of box that I had there. Remember that was Z, that is X1, X2, X3, X4, S1, S2, S3, and the right-hand side. And then you would say, how would I make the numbers, how would I find the numbers, the new numbers for this table? This tableau that I have here to this tableau, the difference is now I would have X1, S2, and S3. And that's an adjacent extreme point because the only difference between that and this is one variable exchanged, OK? But that's the variable that we selected based on some rules. So it comes down here, and we have that. So how do we go from this to that table? It's simply just what you have been doing so far. Just remember that invert of the matrix that you found? Simple, very, very simple. X1, X1, S2, S3. If I have an S2 here, what would I have under the column of S2? Under the column of S2, I would have 1 in here, 0 in here, 0 in here, and 0 in here. What would I have under the column of S3? I would have 0, 0, 0, and 1. What would I have under the column of S1? I don't know. How come I knew that in here? Because S1 was here. So now that X1 is here, what would I have under the column of X1? I would have 0, 1, 0, and 0. And then you say, oh, what about the rest of them? I said, this is your guide. That's not even your guide. I'm just mentioning that to you. This is your guide. It is like you have a vision in your mind, and you're trying to reach that. You're trying to reach from this to this, okay? 
So the way that I'm going to do that for you is I'm going to erase this. That's just a general knowledge. And I'm going to write them very lightly in here for you. That's, that's a vision that you would have, that you want to end up like that. OK, and you start from the pivot. And you say, how would I get that pivot to be 1? I multiply everything by 1 over the pivot. Pivot is 2. To make that 1, I multiply that whole row by 1 half. And I would write it in here. OK? Multiply that by 1 half. I would get 1, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 1, 1 half, 1 half, 1, 1 half, 0, 0, and 10. And then you would say, how do I make that 0? I would say, well, you have to work with the pivot row. You're working with the pivot column and pivot row. Every time you multiply this row by something and add it to the other row. OK? So I'm going to multiply this by negative 1 half and add it to this row. We'll make that 0. OK? Sometimes it is easier to work with this, sometimes with that, whatever it is. But you're trying to make that 0 using that row. That row is the same as this row. So you can use this row or that row. OK? To make that 0, I'll multiply this by negative 1 half and add it here. Or I multiply this by minus 1 and add it there. So this will become 0 by negative 1, negative 1 half, plus 2 will have 3 halves. Negative 1 half plus 5 will be 4 and a half, 9 half. Negative 1 plus 3, that would make it 2. Negative 1 half plus 0 is negative 1 half. Multiplied by 0, no change. Whatever it was remains there. And that remains there. By negative 1 is negative 10, plus 15 is 5. So this has been done. OK? It's a good practice for those of you who are sitting here to do that last row. Those of you who have to leave, please leave, because I'll keep recording until this is done. But those of you who have to leave, please uh, don't stay here. OK? So I would do this now. What is that right now? That should be a 1. Is, is negative 1. No, it should be 1. Oh, you say that's a negative 1. So you have to multiply. That's a negative 1. So I will either multiply this by 1 half and add it here, or just multiply this by 1 and add it there. And that's easier, so I'm going to do that. Multiply this row by 1 and add it there. So 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. 1 half plus 0 is 1 half. 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 half plus 0 is 1 half. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 
10 plus 10 is 20. I have to do the same thing in, in the z. I have to make that 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to either multiply this by 1 half, by 5 halves and add it up here, or just multiply this row by 5 and add it up there. Multiply by 5 is 5 minus 5, that is 0. Multiply by 5 is 5 half. Minus 4 is minus, uh, that's, that's 2 and a half, 1 and a half, so it is negative 3 halves. Is it correct? 5 and 3 is 8, 8 divided by 2 is, okay? So 5 times that is 5 half, minus 3 is minus 1 half. 5 times that plus 1 is 6. 5 times that is 5 half. 5 times that plus, plus, and 5 times 20 is, 5 times, oh, so 5 times 10 is uh, 50. Thank you. So this is a new solution. This is a new solution. And what is this solution? This solution is x1 equal 10, x2 and x3 and x4 are 0. S1 is 0. S2 is 5. S3 is 20. What is the z? 50. 50. Now look at the original, look at the original uh, objective function. It says z equals 5x1. 5 times 10 is 50. And the rest of them are. So that is, that is the solution. That is the solution of this tableau. And z, of course, is always just like that. Now the question is, this is an adjacent. This point, this is an extreme point, feasible extreme point, this is a feasible extreme point. What makes this uh, extreme point feasible? The fact that your basic variables are greater than or equal to zero. Remember, this tableau doesn't have the conditions of x1 greater than zero, x2 greater than zero, x3 greater than zero, and so on. But the fact that these are positive will make this solution feasible. And when we go there, the way that we guarantee that this solution is feasible is through that mean ratio. Mean ratio guarantees that from this tableau to this tableau, you remain feasible. From one feasible extreme point, you go to another feasible extreme point. We will follow the same sort of stuff. We will ask this question from ourselves. Why did we choose something to in, in enter into the basis? Why did we choose something to enter into the basis? to improve z, and the way that we selected it was we looked in here and we selected the one that has the most negative number. And we said, from general point of view, this one, if increased, it would improve my z. And then you would say, okay, so, let me make that the rule. And the rule for me would be I will continue 
this process. I will continue this process until, until I get, I get no negative in here. When I have no negative in here, I can't do any further. I'm at the optimal solution. So what is the clue to whether you are optimal or not is whether you have a negative number there in here. This is for maximization problem. We'll be all, always concentrate on the maximization problem and we will develop special rules for minimization. But we always talk about maximization problem. So we are maximizing this and we will look in here and say, oh, I have a negative in here and I have a negative in here. So let me see. So let me see. Negative here, negative here. Can I uh, improve that, this? I said, yes, because I have negative, I can improve the solution. So we'll go in here and we will select. How did we select that? We looked at for the most negative. So we are in here, we are going to look for the most negative. Negative, three halves, negative, one half. Now, just something that everybody, all the time, they talk about it. There is a most negative, in this case, minus three halves, minus one and a half, is more negative than negative one half. Sometimes people tend to say the biggest number. The bigger number of these two is this one, okay? But the most negative is that one. So when you talk about most negative, we are talking about the magnitude of the number, most negative. So that is the, so this becomes our, what? It becomes our entering variable. And what do we do? We'll do that. Okay. Now I have to find a leaving variable. This is going to come and improve z. I have to find one of these things to go out. I can't have more than three in this case. And the way that I do it, I will go back to that mean ratio concept. How did I find the mean ratio? I looked at the right-hand side values, and I found the ratio between the right-hand side values and the pivot column, the column of entering variable. In here, I'm going to do that. The right-hand side values, the ratio with these numbers, OK? And I will forget about the negatives. If I have a negative number or a 0, I will forget about those. I would not calculate them. Just like this in here, I would put a dash in here. So there is no crisis in there. But these things have critical values. So I'm going to do 10 over 1 half. I'm going to, that's going to be 20. I'm going to do 5 over 3 halves which is going to be 10 third, and I'm going to do 20 over 3 halves, 20 over 3 halves, which would be 40 third. Obviously, that is the mean. Yes? Is it possible that the leading variable row could be the same as the last one, as the last table? Impossible. Impossible. If the same one came in, if the same one came in and the one left, you cannot go back to the same way because notice this, S1 left, S1 left, and what is the value in here? It's 5 half. It's not even considered. That's a positive value. It's not negative. Now, it is possible that when, when I do the next tableau and I want to do the tableau after that, 
again S1 come, wants to come back. But that's a condition based on the values that I get. But not immediately. Okay? Because immediately, if you are going from one point to the next and come back to the same one, it's not going. Well, that's, for now, right now, this is, this is what we are going to be talking about it as, at this time. When we get to the special cases, we talk about those things. So this is, this is, this is what we have in here. So, and that is what is going to be outgoing uh, variable, leaving variable. I draw that, and this becomes my pivot. This becomes my pivot, and I'm going to um, write the same thing, same stuff that I wrote in here. Entering variable is x2 and y, most negative, in 0, leaving variable x, uh, leaving variable s2, mean ratio, mean ratio, and uh, pivot, and here is um, 3, Apps. Now, why I went from this to this? Because there were negative values in the zero. Why I'm going from this to the next one? Because there are negative values in there. So underneath each tableau, one of the other things that you do is you say, is it optimal? No. Why not? Negative values in zero. Optimal. Remember we said this is the solution. Optimal. No. Why not? Negative values in zero. We write all these things because we do want to make sure that we're always uh, okay with these, um, with these things. So, so we have this, we have this, and now we need to go to the next tableau. And as we go to the next tableau, I want, before I go to the next tableau, I want to bring to your attention a couple of things. And that is related to what we had in here. Did by any chance anybody uh, calculated those B inverses and those tableaus that I asked you to do? If you do those, if you do those, you can actually see what the relationship in here is. What the relationship in here is with all those things that you do. For example, for example, in here, in here, what is my solution? S1, S2, S3. S1, S2, S3. If I call that solution B, okay, and find the coefficient of B in the original problem, what is that? It's 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay? What if I invert it? Find the inverse of that. It's another identity matrix. And you look in here, and you have that identity matrix in here. If you multiply that identity, if you multiply that B inverse by your A, in this case it's identity, you get this. Now let's come back here. You have x1, s2, s3. You have x1, s2, s3. In this handout, look what b2 is. 
look what B2 is. B2 is 2, 1, minus 1. These are the coefficients of x1 in the original problem. And what is s2 and what is s3? It's just right here. If you find the inverse of that, this is the inverse. This is where that inverse is. If you multiply that inverse by a, b inverse a, <coughs> you will get this. If you multiply b inverse by cb, cb b inverse, this is what you get. If you multiply cb b inverse a minus c, this is what you get. Okay? This is a little bit further relating the stuff that we have learned to what we are discussing. But right now, we are just doing the numbers. So our next tableau, and I will just write the tableau, but it is the same idea. We just talk about it. I'll, I'll raise this to just create space for the tableau. <coughs> um, so we can wrap up the session. So I will have a tableau which looks like this. X1, X2, X3, S1, S2, S3, right hand side, um, Z, Z. What is coming? X2 is coming. Where is it going? It's going to go in here. So I have X1, X2, S3. And this is the tableau. When I do the tableau, I will, on, when I finish the work, I will get under x1, remember, under x1, I will get this. Under x2, I will get this. Under s3, I will get that. These are the things that I know. But how do I get these numbers by concentrating in here? How would I do it? I'll make that a 1. How would I make that a 1? I'll multiply this row by 2 third. So multiplying the row by the 2 third will make that 1. Multiplying that by 2 third, multiplying that by 2 third, by 2 third, by 2 third, by 2 third, by 2 third. It will create that row for me and so on. So these are the numbers, the final numbers that we will get. I will get a 4 in here. I would get an 8 in here. I will get minus 1, 3, and minus 10. I would get one third. In here, I will get um, that's four third in here, and I will get minus five third in here. I would get a two in here. Um, where's x4? I, I missed x4. Um, <clears throat> yes, x4. S1, S2, S3, and right hand side. S1 will be 2. S2 will be 1, S3 will be 0, right hand side will be 55, 0. Hmm? The rest of them, yeah, um, I would just 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, S1 will be 
two, and then I would have two third, and this one is negative one third. This one is five third. Um, no, that's that's two. That's two two third negative negative one third negative one third five third. This one is one negative one third two third and. Um, that is six and seven. Negative seven third, and that's one, and that's this, and the right hand side will be <clears throat> twenty-five third, and that's ten third, and that is twenty-five third. Okay. Underneath that, we would say this is the solution. Underneath that, we will say this is the solution. This is the solution values that we have, and it is optimal because there is no negative number in here. And that's how you solve a simplex. Uh, that's how you solve a linear programming problem using simplex method. Again, the way that we calculated this was going from this tableau to this tableau by trying to make that one, this zero, that zero, and that zero. And the way that we did it, we multiplied the pivot row by a number and added it up to the other rows every time by a specific number add them up to the, to the other rows to get to make that zero. And as we are doing that, it will change all the numbers to get. And that's it. Well, on Monday, we will continue the, the lecture in our class.